Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we're talking with two guests who are going from the United States, along with people from around the world, to the COP27 conference in Egypt. One of them is Nancy Mancias, who is a doctoral student in anthropology and social change at the California Institute of Integral Studies. She holds an MBA from Dominican University of California, BA in Drama from San Francisco State University. She's worked over 15 years in the nonprofit profit sector, focusing on social services, social justice, and theater. She has volunteered and visited the refugee camps in Greece and Kurdistan, Iraq, and provided migrant support on the U.S.-Mexico border. As an anti-war advocate, Moncias has been actively trying to bring the troops home from their overseas misadventures. She has also been part of the movement against torture and a proponent of closing the prison in Guantanamo. Our other guest, Cindy Peister, is a lifetime activist and organizer focusing on peace, justice, human rights, and the military impacts on the climate crisis. A former cable access television alternative media producer and host, and a U.S. war crimes documentarian, she is the surviving spouse of Vietnam veteran John Peister and a founding member of Veterans for Peace Climate Crisis and Militarism Project, also a board member with a national unitarian organization, a member of WILPF US's Climate Justice and Women and Peace Project and WILPF's, WILPF's International Environmental Working Group. WILPF is, of course, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Nancy and Cindy, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you, David. Oh, great, great, great to be, to be here, here with you, David. Great to be here with Nancy. It's really an honor. Thank you. So uh, whichever you, of you wants to do the introductions here, what is COP27 uh, for people who haven't heard about it? And Nancy, do you want to start or shall I? Go right ahead, Cindy. Okay, go ahead. So uh, COP27 is uh, a meeting, a uh, convention of the parties um, brought together by the uh, UN uh, uh for peoples from around the world and particularly state actors to address the climate problems that have been going on all these years. Um, from the perspective of many of us who are active uh, in this movement, um, we are, have been continually disappointed at the, at the results that have come out of this. Uh, just last year at, at COP26, for example, um, there were, uh, some 500 representatives at the COP that were had ties to the gas and oil industry, which was double the number of attendees from um, the people around the world that were on front, from frontline communities. So uh, we're going there again. We have very, very high hopes. We have things that we want to accomplish. Um, and we'll see how receptive they are and how much we can push the envelope in getting them to actually take serious steps to address uh, such issues as the uh, Green Climate Fund, uh, loss and damages, and uh, uh, WILF US and many other uh, organizations. I mean, Code Pink and uh, World Beyond War have done tremendous work in trying to call out the role of military emissions in climate. So uh, all of those are on the agenda and uh, this is going to be held in November and Nancy and I will both be there with many, many activists from around the world and we'll see how it goes. Yeah, so I just want to add on to what Cindy has said that um, COP26, as some of you may know, took place uh, in Glasgow, Scotland last year this year, it will be taking place in Sharm El Sheikh in, um, in Egypt. Um, and we are part of a uh, climate and militarism working group uh, looking at the war economy and its destruction to our lives and in our communities and in our planet. Uh, would you like me to go on? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, sure. I mean for for people who weren't involved in this last year and, and don't know what's going on may wonder what the military has to do with climate uh you know whether you love wars or hate them what's the what's the connection 
Sure. So militaries in wars are the leading, um, are the number one leading uh, use of fossil fuel, uh, using fossil fu fuels. Countries hide this in their emissions report. But I have to tell you, David and Cindy, that that is about to change because of the incredible work that uh, World Beyond War, Veterans for Peace, WILF, and Code Pink, and our allies at the Climate and Militarism uh, Working Group are doing. Um, last year during COP26 in Glasgow, we saw the discussion of military emissions taking place outside of COP. This year, and this is historic, there are going to be three military emissions events taking place inside of COP27, official events. And this is incredible. And this is due to our work that we did uh, last year. Um, there is even uh, one event called No War, No Warming, organized by our friends at the Global Grassroots Justice Alliance. Now, David, if you think back last year when we were having all those organizing calls, trying to figure out how are we going to tackle the largest climate change event in the world and what were we going to do? And we decided to have these outdoor outside events. Well, that is all paid off because not only are we going to be outside, but we are going to be officially inside talking about military greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and um, the event in the world, um, we didn't. So why are we doing this? Um, it is to close the military uh, emissions gap that was created by the US government to countries from recording their greenhouse gas emissions in the Kyoto Protocol. Well, I mean, Nancy, it, it sounds wonderful and, and hopeful. And uh, let me do the, the glass half empty and full of toxic sludge version. Uh, the earth doesn't stop warming and the, and the feedback loops don't fail to kick in and the collapse and the catastrophe doesn't get averted because we get a meeting. Uh, some of us were actually had high hopes that raising hell last year uh, in Scotland might get some countries to actually uh, reduce their military emissions or even so, so if if getting them to if getting them to say what they're doing is one step and before that you have to have a meeting and before that you have to protest to get to have the meaning. How many steps away are we from actually uh, reducing military emissions? Uh, and won't that actually re require reducing militarism? Uh, I, I mean, green press releases about green tanks notwithstanding, uh, you know, uh, how, how far are, are we away from, from that sign of progress? Yeah, that's a really good point. And certainly this is not going to happen overnight. I mean, social justice struggles, it takes years and years of change. But just the fact that we did this in one year, we did this as a social movement, as a climate change activist, as anti-war activists, this happened within a year and this is something to celebrate and to recognize but yeah you're certainly right this is going to take years for countries to actually take this on but i have to say it's going to be baby steps and this is a baby step that i'm willing to celebrate Cindy, you want to add to that yeah yeah i would you know i agree with nancy we do need to celebrate our wins However, we have to recognize, too, that if we don't meet, uh, if 2024 is not our year of peak emissions, uh, that we will not be able to not only meet the 1.5 degrees Celsius rise in temperature that uh, the IPCC and the UN has been calling for and international countries have been calling for, but uh, we will probably not be able to meet the uh, 2 point tree. Uh, two point degree Celsius rise in temperature either. So that's very, very disheartening because we are nowhere near that. And we are not, um, we're even with all of the nationally determined contributions that are already on the table, we're falling far short. So um, we really have to have progress. And if we are to have a livable climate, 
at the end of the century. So, um, you know, one thing that Veterans for Peace is doing is our, our veterans are being arrested. They were arrested last week in Michigan uh, to call attention to this. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, and one of the other things that I've been working on uh, for some time now is getting resolutions passed and doing as much networking as possible. Now, I know Code Pink and, and uh, World Beyond War has just done incredible incredible networking in terms of bringing uh, civil society into this conversation. Uh, but we still have such a long ways to go. It, it's really very dire. Um, uh, uh, Veterans for Peace has been having, uh, offering uh, free uh, slideshow presentations around the country. They've got, we've got about 100 that we've done in the last, I don't know, 18 months or so. Uh, we're trying to cross cross boundaries and work with groups that are essentially uh, climate oriented, but not necessarily peace oriented. Um, and uh, WILF uh, International, uh, as Nancy said, the uh, environmental working group there, uh, we're, we are uh, working very hard internationally. There's going to be a focus this year on Africa. We've got a 10 woman delegation that's going to the COP27. Half of them are from Africa, uh, where they're feeling these impacts most harshly already, as well as the island nations. So the, the US has got to step up. It's very discouraging to hear from John Kerry that there's no way that we're going to address loss and damages. That's just incomprehensible. When, when in fact, the United States has been the largest cumulative producer of greenhouse gas emissions. And um, our, as, as, as Nancy just said, you know, our military is the world's largest uh, institutional user of fossil fuels and the world's largest institutional producer of greenhouse gas emissions. And David, what you said about having to cut the military is absolutely dead on. We've got to look at the cost, not only in terms of emissions, but in terms of um, the dollar amounts that we're, we're spending on, on our military and our disorientation in terms of what true national security or global security actually means. Yeah. I. Uh, I, I, I hate to be, you know, it's sounding the, the alarm of, of negative news, but it, it seems like at the same time that we've got our act together and we've raised hell and we've got these meetings in the conference, hopefully with some results to come out of those meetings, we've seen a dramatic increase in weapons production, weapons testing, weapons use. Uh, we've seen a, a, a war in Ukraine doing incredible environmental damage. Uh, pipelines intentionally uh, sabotaged and fossil fuels flowing into the Baltic Sea. Uh, huge amounts of money being shifted from useful things to militarism. Uh, Western states in the U.S. shutting down uh renewable energy product projects that they were going to work on because they have nuclear missiles in their states, you know, and somehow that's, that conflicts. Uh, I, I mean, it seems, it seems like the military, it, it, the U S and other militaries are doing more damage than ever, aren't they? Right. Yeah, you well, know, I, I'm sorry, just real quick, Nancy, I'll get right off. But, you know, yeah, the whole effort to greenwash this, we hear all about what all the different military branches are doing uh, towards, uh, you know, greening their nonviolent or their weapons uh, um, to get off of fossil fuels. It is so far short. So you're absolutely right to call this off. I'll get off. Nancy, go ahead. Oh, oh, no, I just wanted to, to thank Cindy. I just wanted to add that even though we've had this success in getting military greenhouse gas emissions into the COP27 officially, there um, is a movement that has just completely given up on COP27 and yes. has given up on the process and has completely given up on the United Nations altogether. And I can say that groups in the Global South are organizing an alternative COP27 called an Earth Assembly, which will take place on November 3rd. It'll be an online um, launch. 
And they want to do things like broaden the issue of climate change and bring in issues about war and peace um, because of these ongoing wars, these ongoing fossil fuel wars that are taking place. Mm -hmm. So um, there is an alternative that's happening out there. Um, so I just wanted to pull back a little bit and look at where the COP27 is taking place. It's taking place in Egypt. Um, a country known for its horrendous human rights violations. And groups such as the COP27 want to leverage global attention um, to demand human rights and a just transition for climate change. Um, and it is up to us to challenge and undermine the Egyptian government for whitewashing and greenwashing during the COP27 because they will put themselves at the center of the world stage to show how great they are and whitewash all the atrocities that they have committed. So we can't separate human rights from the rights of the planet. Um, so this is something that um, we, as a social justice movement, need to figure out how do we bring this into the fold as we are successfully having these meetings around military emissions at the COP27, but how do we keep these um, atrocities and these prisoners that are wrongfully being detained in Egypt front and center? Will there be marches and demonstrations and rallies in the streets and squares in Egypt as there were in Scotland? And if there are, what will the response of the Egyptian government be? Well, that's a very interesting question, David. You know, I know that there's a um, going to be a protest in Cairo uh, following um, the COP27, but the way that um, uh, Egypt has set up uh, this COP27. It's all in an enclosed structure in a tourist town far removed from the large populations. So right away, we know we're not going to be able to see another Glasgow, which, you know, was very disheartening because seeing 100,000 people in the streets last year was very motivating. Um, now, um, we hear from... Um, the head of, of, of Antonio Guterres, that having this COP in Egypt is a wonderful chance for Africa to bring forward their serious um, problems with climate. And in a way, that's true because, for example, the women delegates that are coming from Will from Africa don't have to travel transatlantically or something like that to be present and to participate. But when we look at the human rights history of the LCC government, I mean, one has to wonder why we would be having it there. But um, I don't have an answer to that. Why would you have a protest after a conference you're trying to influence? Uh, and how would you know it was going to be a protest unless you were sure nothing good was going to come of the conference before well, it happened? Well, well I just, you know, this wasn't clear. organized by us in this country. This is organized by the activists in Egypt. And uh, I assume, although I don't really know, uh, Cairo is a massive city and, and a hotbed of, of dissatisfaction. Uh, so um, why they're having it afterwards, I, I don't know what the outcome will be. We don't know that either. We do know that um, the Egyptian government has said that, you know, those of us who are in opposition will be free to engage in our uh, dissent. Although I think it's very important that we be very careful about how we go about that. Uh, we don't want to be kicked out of the country and we certainly don't want to put our, our brothers and sisters uh, in Egypt uh, under greater stress. So we're kind of walking a line trying to figure that all out. And we'll probably be walking that line all through COP27 as well. So I, I, I wish I had better answers to give you, David, but this yeah. is the best that I can offer at this point. So I, I just, yeah, I just want to caution call, calling it a protest because it's already um, such a, a um, a sensitive issue for Egyptians, but there is a gathering that is happening, an event that is happening in Cairo, November 20th through the 27th um, at a union office in, um, in that city. And um, it does make sense to have it in Cairo. If you look at the layout of Sharm el-Sheikh, 
Um, it is apparently a tourist town with a wall built around it. So even Egyptian civil society, even if they wanted to come, they would have to go through this wall or a tunnel, go through checkpoints, probably be denied access into um, the actual Shamar Sheikh um, area. So it does make sense um, to have it where um, folks in Egypt can participate in an after, um, an after event, perhaps some reflection, um, because I, I think what we're going to see is um, the local Egyptian population being excluded um, from this COP27. Cindy and I will find ourselves isolated in this resort town unable to connect um, with the Egyptian civil society and activists. So I applaud them for having an event. It's just unfortunate that for some of us Westerners were um, unable to, to do both. And I wish I had known about uh, this Cairo gathering um, uh, ahead of time. Well, maybe we need to send people from around the world to the extent that we can and that the jet fuel use is justified to both Cairo and COP27. Uh, but, but what can people, I mean, we know which nations, governments, and industries are most at fault here. We know which governments are most recalcitrant about uh, solving this problem. What, what should people be doing uh, in the weeks leading up yeah. to COP27 to increase the likelihood that nations' representatives will do anything good there? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And if um, there, I counted, there are 26 events happening leading up to COP27, one of them being this Earth Assembly that's happening on November 3rd, um, and another one that's happening in Washington, D.C., here in the States, um, gosh, I think uh, the first week in October when the World Bank and IMF are having their annual meeting in Washington, D.C., so there are different events going on, but if people want to go to the Earth Assembly website and check out what these different 26 events are. Um, and as I said, some people have just entirely given up on going to COP27. My gosh, it's far. It's super no. expensive. So people are doing alternative events um, in New York City, outside the UN. Um, so you can go to the Code Pink website, the Veterans for Peace website, the uh, World Beyond War website, and find out how to plug in um, with these different just, events. Just to be clear, these 26 events are all about saving the climate, but they're not all necessarily about the, the role of militarism in destroying the climate, right? Some of them are, um, are a mix. I'm sorry, Cindy. Some of them are a mix. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really up to us as anti-war activists and as peace activists to bring that message to these events. Because if we don't bring these message, messages to the climate change events, then no one else is. So it's really our responsibility to do that. Yeah, you know, I, I guess um, with all three of us being citizens of the United States and being the citizens of the, one, the worst offender globally, um, and with militarism, you know, I, I think we just need to encourage civil society here in our own country to put as much pressure as possible on our legislators, on our State Department, on John Kerry, on, on uh, the Obama administration. Uh, you know, we hear what they're doing for climate, but it's, you know, Veterans for Peace sent out a letter, um, was it uh, 20... I'm not sure 2020, was it 2020 or 2021? I think it was just 2021. Anyway, we had hundreds of signatures on that. Um, and we were planning on meeting and had thought we were going to be meeting with John Kerry himself to discuss this. But after he got our letter, which was very powerfully written, uh, to center um, climate action on U.S. militarism, we didn't have that meeting. It was canceled or it never happened, so, so to speak. But I, I don't think we can afford to lighten up. You know, I, I think it's incumbent on all of us here in the United States to, number one, confront our own government to the very best of our ability. Uh, if anybody out there that might hear this is um, has any extra, extra spare change, uh, Veterans for Peace is looking for funding 
funding in order to get their veterans to these events so they can be arrested and also to help cover the uh, costs that come out of that because they're putting themselves on the line for this um, with the understanding that their voices carry a little more credibility when we talk about militarism than those of us who, that haven't actually participated in military service. We, we've got just a few minutes left, and I wonder if, do you all think I'm right that we kind of dropped the ball for the first 25 of these darn things? I mean, why did we appear at number 26 in such strength and energy and excitement? And then why have so many uh, abandoned the cause after that one year of effort? Uh, where were we for 25 years, and how are we going to continue to be there for the next uh, however many years it takes? Well, you know, one thing I'd like to say is Edward Snowden released in his documents um, something where I, I don't remember exactly what year it was. I'm sorry, forgive me, uh, maybe uh, 2015 or something uh, that, you know, the U.S. Uh, National Security Agency was actually spying on COP delegates in order to undermine the process so that we would know what they were going to say. Uh, you know, we have to look at ourselves as big oil uh um, industry supporters, uh, all of our subsidies to the oil industry, and um, the fact that even though we say that we are doing this and that we are doing that, when you look at the military budget, uh, it's, uh, you know, what, 10 times what we're offering climate or more. This is all use of the word we to mean the U.S. government. What about we, the good people of the world, and in particular in the United States? Uh, Nancy, where have we been and how do we keep going? Yeah, I, you know, I do have to say that from what I understand, when the COP was in Paris, there was an attempt to bring the no war, no warming um, message to that COP. But then I don't know if you all remember, there was a terrorist attack in Paris and, and then they pulled back and realized that this wasn't the right time for, uh, for controversial issues. Um, so there was an attempt. Um, but I just wanted to um, express my gratitude and appreciation of World Beyond War and you, David, for helping us um, bring people together last year for COP26 and having these, you know, weekly calls leading up and um, making sure that uh, our message was uh came through, and I have to honestly say, it came through out of, what, hundreds of thousands of people. And pe people were just like, really? There, This is a problem? It's like, yes, it's a problem. So we did the education on the ground. We mobilized ourselves, and we just got to keep doing that. And look where we're at today. Even though, you know, having three military missions events in COP27 is um, is a small step, but we we just have to take these small wins. Well, I, I wish we had more seconds to keep talking. We don't, very, very tragically. Uh, we could go on for hours, uh, but Nancy Moncias and Cindy Peister, I want to thank you for all the incredible work you're doing uh, and thank all the people and organizations and all the European people and groups that were involved uh, last year. Uh, and I hope we can all get more involved uh, in the years to come. We'll get, the, we'll get that list of all the upcoming events and put it at talkworldradio.org. Cindy and Nancy, thank you so, so much for coming on Talk World Radio. Uh, alternative media is a big key. Thank you, David. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.